Uh, we're going to talk about commercial mushrooms a little bit. That's in the center are the white button agaricus bisporus variants. We're going to talk about log cultivation. And we're going to talk about spawn in some sort of a substrate, usually sawdish ships. And we're going to start with history. So these are the mushroom caves in Paris, where at least our current mushroom history starts. So it's an interesting story because spores, until we had microscopes, were something that no one understood even where things like ferns came from. So we're going to talk about the history of cultivation, starting with spawn and spores, and then some basics, what's, what it takes. Then talk about logs, spawn types, and we'll end up with resources and organizations. I am not an expert on this. We have several people in the club who are and do this routinely. I have done it, but I don't do it routinely. So just to kind of put a timestamp on it, um, spores, you know, there was no microscopes around until Van Leeuwenhoek uh, really perfected the microscope. And that was more in the 17th century. But they were first discovered in 1588. And that happens to be the year of the Spanish Armada. So it's an easy thing to remember. Uh, and before that, people thought that things like ferns and club mosses uh, they couldn't, they, they thought that the, the seed must be invisible because they knew it had to be there. So if you don't believe that, uh, King Henry IV, this is a Shakespeare play in 1597, uh, Falstaff uses the line that we're going to have fern seed in our pockets so we can be invisible. So it was, it was kind of a lore thing that's, 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 that these things were invisible. But it was not until 1729 that the first idea of a mushroom fungus growing from uh, a spore and what the idea of spawn came about. Those two spores that you're seeing there, by the way, were two that were taken from one of the animals who ate a anosidae, which happens to be one of the more poisonous types, which uh, is why I used it here to show you how weird they can get. So if you look at a dictionary, spawn has a bunch of definitions and they're all there, but the one we care about is number three, the mycelium of fungi, especially in mushrooms grown to be eaten. So uh, I'm not sure if I would necessarily agree with that, but this spawn implies we're gonna do something with it, like grow. So the caves of mushroom uh, the, of Paris are a reality and it supposedly starts with King Henry or Louis XIV, the Sun King, you may have heard of that. And so he apparently uh, developed the faunus. And, and part of the reason was because they were growing in the horse manure that was dumped outside of the caves of Paris as they were moving, excavating stone and quarries under Paris. Uh, part of it was the catacombs, but part of it was just quarrying for stone. And that's where they would find them. And then the, the king's uh, supposed to be his farmer. I think it's more likely his cook, but his name was Monsieur Chambry. Anyway, he had the idea of, well, why don't we put the piles of manure back into the caves? And that's where it sort of started. Uh, and then, in, so the French were all behind this. In 1678, uh, the botanist Marchand, he's called Pierre Marchand. He was the first one that actually demonstrated that, there, that spawn is what created mushrooms. So this is what, for the all throughout the 19th century, when they stopped using the catacombs, but the champignons of Paris were able, they were growing them year round now in the catacombs. Uh, and by 1880, there were over 300 of these little mushroom farms in, the, in Paris. And you can see what they look like. Uh, and these were basically rooms of about 30 meters by 30 meters, uh, a thousand, a thousand square meters, that is. And they, they would produce about 300 kilograms of mushrooms every week. And so it's very similar to the process that we use today. Uh, and, but we don't use caves or catacombs, but that's kind of where it started. Now, independently of this, Log cultivation comes to us from China and Japan. And this is uh, a quote from Paul Stamets' book, Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms, which I've read, which is a kind of a tome. It's not much to read, but it's a good background book. Um, so it's actually more in depth than that. Uh, it, so I did a little more research. It starts with the Song Dynasty, the official cultivation. That's about 1000 common era. Uh, and that's where they would cut logs 
and they would soak, they call it soaking and striking. Um, the study of inoculation started there in 1904, and this is where the first sort of modern era. Uh, and the reason they're called shiitake because they grow on a shia tree. I don't know how they pronounce that, but that's that's where the name comes from. Taki means mushroom in Japanese. You probably knew that, or maybe you figured it out by now. My taki, everything's taki, so that's why. By 1997, there were 1.3 million metric tons. That thing on the right, I gave my daughter a birthday present years ago. Uh, this is where you grow your own shiitakes and, in a, and you buy a kit. So this is how far we got. So, and I'll talk about those a little bit too. So it, when you're talking, it's important to, and this is from also from Spanish. I'm not sure if we use this too much. It, we don't really, but he tends to think of it as and it is true. There are primary decomposers in any, or the things we grow on wood, like shiitake. Then there are the secondary decomposers, and that's more of the tray or bed culture, and they're growing more on composite materials. And classically, your button mushroom, and most of the other uh, mushrooms that we grow. I mean, some are on sawdust, but mostly it's on. So they're secondary decomposers. And then finally, there are the tertiary, which is third, which is the stuff in the soil. And Helis, Canosity, Agrosity, and Plutus, and some Agaricus, I'm not sure if I, that's still all that true. The book is pretty old. And as you know, things have moved on a lot. So, so here is kind of the master diagram of, of how you get to spawn and what you do with spawn. So you can either buy it from several places, and uh, we'll talk about where. I'm keeping an eye on the time here. Uh, and or you can clone it right out of you can see right here you can cut a little piece out the best place is near the cap is right at the top of the cap where it's, it's growing fairly rapidly and put it in a petri dish and you make agar to make a culture medium and, or you can use spores you can take a spore print and you can you do either one uh people i've talked to that have done it think the clone method is a little bit better just because it's a little more consistent uh, as clones tend to be more co better copies of the parent, spores could be, you know, a, a large number of things. And the, the reason why this is difficult, you have to keep it absolutely pristine while you're doing this process, or you'll get stray spores and you, you'll never know what you got. So that's why you tend to buy this. It's certainly, and for people who would be trying this, you certainly wouldn't want to make it on your first round. You'd want to buy a spore. And then you you put it in the grain or something just to make it, just to spread it through the grain and then you from the grain is that's when you inoculate things like bags or logs or trays and bags so there you get your uh, process and this can be scaled up or done just for a couple logs however much you would want to try so the growing process basically is you culture it on usually agar, which is, I think, a, a, a seaweed a medium. I'm not positive, but it's very common. It's used throughout chemistry or uh, biology. So you, you can, with one petri dish, you can inoculate 10 liters of gram. And then with that, you can boost a, a million pounds of mushrooms in 12 weeks, just to give you an idea of the expansion. Uh, so you sterilize the agar, uh, and then you extract the clone, best near the base above the mycelium. And, and then you can, you can start to spawn. After seven to 10 days, you place the segments of spawn in gray. So that's the process, so you have to let it sit. So we're gonna walk through that with pictures. Because when I first started, about 2005, I met this guy who was had been hired by uh, Pogo's uh, Tree Service and out in Sunshine, Maryland. And they had mulch and trees everywhere. And he and two of his colleagues, they actually sent them to Paul Stamus's course uh, that he taught for how to start a mushroom operation with a big, you know, trucks, the whole deal. And so I, I spent about probably six months every weekend out there working with him. His name was Jim Lowry. And so this is kind of a little house we were working in. And just to give you pictures of what things look like, uh, this is the agar. Um, Petri dishes you're familiar with. Um, you need a sterilizer to do this. And then of course you have to uh, something to weigh with. And here's your sawdust, which you're gonna sterilize that as well. And then you're gonna mix the agar, sterilize it, 
And in this particular case, we were using uh, Spawn Commercialize, and this was bought from Fungi Perfecti, which is Paul Stavis's company. I understand they're not making this anymore, but they used to. And so then you pour the agar into the Petri dish right here in your sterilizer. You're in a, a sterilized room here. And we hear you all are all in the room doing all this. And it's, so you've got a sterilizer right here where you're sterilizing your knife. And then when you're done, you seal the Petri dish and everything is, you don't even breathe on it. I don't think we wore masks, but probably only because they were everywhere. And we probably should have anyway. So here's everything ready to go and sitting in the corner for seven days. So I came back the next week. And here we are, we started out by getting the rye grain ready. So you can see we're sterilizing it. And here's all our, our grain uh, in the jars. And so the next step is you open it and then you put the, the stuff in and, and you let it run. So this is a, a third week out. And you can see the, the spawn has run through all of the grain. And so from that grain, then you put that into the bags. And so then from the bags, you go outside and here are all the bags. And we also were doing some stunts. So with all of this training and all of this effort, we could never get anything to grow. We never figured out why. And the whole operation was shut down at the end of the summer and Pogo fired everybody. So it just to show that it's, it's a difficult thing to get right and some people are better at it than others. So when you scale this up, this is Phelps Mushrooms which, with whom we've had a long relationship. They provided many, and this is a real industrial operation. I went out there three years ago to pick up the mushrooms for our, one of our culinary events. It's the mushroom capital of the world. And I wandered around the lot um, and, you know, truckloads of mushrooms, literally. Uh, very specific precautions, again, for problems with um, contamination. And this is what the stuff that, this is the, the stuff that didn't take. This, I mean, these are, these are all oyster mushrooms. So it's, this is the, the, the throwing them out. I, I, was, I was a sacrilege to me to see this. Anyway, so... Let's, we're going to segue now. Okay, what is it we need? What is it that the fungi need to, to do this? They need food. In our case, it's either wood, plant, debris for primary and then manure based or, you know, the, the metabolites from the secondary. They need water, which is probably the most important part uh, of getting the logs to work, I think. Uh, they need oxygen, just like all heterotrophs. We need oxygen. And they need light. There are some that grow in the dark. This idea, you know, everybody feeds me bullshit to a mushroom. That, that's that old adage. It's not really true. Uh, they do need some light, most of them. And also, uh, one of the things that's come up recently is mushrooms are very good in vitamin D, and particularly if they get UV light. And they actually sell, you can see this package that says vitamin D. Uh, and this, wait, this is D2. There's D2 is from plants and D3 is from animals, but you mostly here you get it from the sun. Well, you can get it from the sun via mushrooms. And they actually expose them to UV light and jack up their uh, vitamin D up to 11 micrograms. And you only need five, so that's enough. And this is USDA right off their website to provide appreciable amounts of vitamin D. So it is true. So the stages of cultivation, we're now gonna walk through the log part because that's what you more likely would do. And I actually did this uh, twice. I did it in front of an audience once uh, at a nature center here in Columbia. Uh, and so it's not hard, even when you're being watched. Uh, the, the biggest problem is getting logs, believe it or not. So we're going to walk through each of these just very briefly. So media preparation, you need hardwood. And you can see the logs down here on the lower left. And this is hopefully what you're going to end up with in the right. And remember, you want the wood to be pretty pristine. You don't want any fallen logs. You don't want any with other fungi growing on them because if you do, they're already run and they're not gonna take to what you want to put in them. So disease-free, fresh little wall or cut them. Uh, denser hardwoods are better, but you only got a couple months if you really wanna do it right. 
And it's, it's hard to find these, or unless you live on a wood lot and you have your own, it's, it's not easy to find logs. I, I know I tried numerous times. Um, white oak is recommended for stocking. Um, so best is, is late winter, early spring. Firewood's no good. And here's about the size you need, two to four feet in length and 40 inches in diameter. Log moisture is critical. And this, the, the book I use, I use Paul Stamets and also Trad Carter's book. And I got this out of Trad Carter's book. Getting the moisture right is critical, I, I think. And most people, I don't think, do this correctly. Uh, this is the way you do it with dry weight. I won't go into it, but you basically wet weight versus dry weight. So you weigh them periodically to see how much water they have. And they need 35 to 55%. And most people just throw them outside and hope for the best, which, which is what I did. And three years later, I get, after I give up going out there, I went out there and there, there was finally about three shiitakes on it. But, you know, the fungus never gets up, even if you do. So you don't need much. You need spawn. One way that you grow it yourself or you buy it. It's not very expensive. It comes in dowels, which are little wooden things. I'll show you what those look like. You need a drill bit. The size of the bit depends on the dowels that you get. You need a rubber mallet to pound them in. You need wax to cover them. You don't want anything else getting in there after you put it in there. So it's just the mycelium and the lawn. Uh, you need a heater to melt the wax uh, in a container. And then you need a paintbrush. So most of it's for the wax. So we're just going to walk through the steps. Uh, you get the log, you drill uh, about five, sixteen inches. And, and you, it, the, the spawn kit you get will tell you what diameter drill you need and tell you how deep you need to go. And the hole should be about four inches apart and offset in a diamond pattern. Again, you're trying to spread out the mycelium. And about 20 holes in a two foot log, that's about right. If you're doing stumps, you can see how those are configured, but then they're already in the ground. So you don't need to worry about too much more. So this is what the, this is what the spawn looks like when you get it in bags. And you don't want to open it until just before you're going to use it for obvious reasons. So you open the bag with clean hands, remove it out, put it in the hole, pound it in, hit it down to flush, and then fill it with wax. So that means putting the wax on the stove. While, before you got there, you don't you know, walk into the kitchen and now spend an hour rousing wax. You want this right there. Uh, and, you, and you should use uh, water. You don't, don't cook the wax because the wax does, it does catch on fire, as you probably have learned with your candles. So you want to put it in a water floating in a pan. In a pan. That's how you do it. You don't need much. It's pretty cheap. I got mine from the Mushroom People, which is one of the companies that is, I think still out there. They were pretty good. It came within a couple of days. That was before the pandemic and the logistics issue. So it may be a week now. I don't know. Uh, and then you apply wax to both ends and wax the holes. And so if you're doing the stumps, you basically do the same thing. So let's just look at the pictures of that. So here we are drilling. Notice I've got my drill bit taped at 1.25 inches. So you don't have to measure. So you just do it until, the, until you see the tape go down a hole when you're, you're 1.25. Uh, and there's this is what I mean by the wax. You have water in here. You're boiling the water in the wax in a separate dish. You got flashpoint issues. So then you pound the dowel in. And then you put the wax over it to, to seal it. And then you seal, and this shows all the sealed holes. And then you seal the end of it also. So everything is contained. So then you're done. So you put the, the logs, you generally do more than one. And you can see typically this would be a tree's worth or so. On pallets, you want them separate so they can all breathe. No contact with the soil, short, a moisture area. And you, so you, you water every two weeks for 10 minutes. That's the trap cotter recipe also. So rather than going through this weighing routine, which I think would be pretty pretty tiresome, where do you, where do you get a scale out there? And then you put a burlap bag over them to make sure that um, you retain the moisture adequately. So then you wait. Uh, and if you did everything right and you go out and check your moisture, It'll take about six to 12 months to completely colonize the log. You, you tell that by looking at the ends, because you can see uh, the mycelia emerging at the ends of the log. 
and it should be modeled about 45, 65%. That indicates that there's mycelium behind the wax. And that's when you know you're ready. So that means that it should be fruity. And if it's not, then you need to do something. Uh, and so you could start it, you could trigger it. Sometimes environmental factors, a temperature drop will do it. Uh, humidity of greater than 90% sometimes is needed. And what, what was recommended is you submerge it in water for about 24 hours, and that should trigger it. Uh, rainwater in a tub would be better. And you could also vert, vert, vertically in sand uh, to promote getting wet. So how do I know when they're ready? Now, most of us know what a mature mushroom looks like. Look, try to do it just before they drop the spores is best because that's the peak of their maturity. And you're not interested in spreading spores here. So you're, you grew these, so they're yours to cultivate. So there's no debate about spreading spores when you're doing this. And then after you've got your first harvest, as you probably know, there's a lot of wood in there. And you should be able to get two to five flushes or harvests or uh, crops, if you will. Uh, and each one will be reduced from the first. So it's, it's decreasing returns to scale. Uh, and you let them rest for eight weeks and then, again, keep them warm with moisture. And it depends on the type of uh, fungus that you use here. So these are uh, seven of the available ones. There probably are more now that are available for cultivation. Of course, the one that is most common, I already covered, it's not listed here, is of course, oh, here it is. So it is Lantinus adodides, it's the shiitake. That's um, probably the most common. This is the, the uh, and the one that I, actually the one we demonstrated that I showed you from Sunshine, Maryland, that was the full of uh, which is head of the woods. Uh, so the other ones are, are also uh, available. I'm going to show you what these look like. And these are the ones that are also com are commercially done. Um, and just to give you an idea how popular this is becoming, in 1978, uh, there were um, 1 billion kilograms of, mush of mushrooms were sold. And today, uh, 40 years later, it's 34 billion. So, and this gives you the, this is out of... Uh, Britt Bunyard's Fungi Magazine last month. So you can see shiitakes, um, oysters, uh, tree ear, agaricus bisporus, or the button mushroom, uh, straw mushrooms, and anodides. I probably didn't pronounce that right. But anyway, those are most of them, about 20% each. Uh, China has 87% of it, and mostly because they went to bag culture from the log culture. So this just gives you an, uh, the shiitake production growth, uh, again, showing by year. So it's really an escalating, uh, and this is the wood ear, or it, what used to be auricularia aureo, it's now something else. So one of the issues, and the other thing that comes out from uh, the North American Mycological Association are the poisonings that have occurred. So this year, because so many people are eating these, there's a, a prevalence of people getting sick from eating Shiitakes, and this is from uh, Michael Bung's annual um, survey. Shiitake was zero 10 years ago, and now it's 10% of the people who report uh, some sort of reaction. And specifically this uh, dermatitis, uh, oyster mushrooms, uh, particularly raw and undercooked. And these are showing up in databases for people getting sick. Uh, gastrointestinal distress, um, diarrhea. I had a whole bunch of mushroom, uh, oyster mushrooms about six months ago, and I had diarrhea for and I've never had that before. So um, it appears to me that it, people get some sort of a reaction over time. So here's an oki. Uh, that was one with listeria. Uh, and with a warning, when you're buying these things commercially, be careful where you get it. This was uh, in June 2020. You may have read about that. And also the tree ear, which is in, typically found in Chinese soups. This is the uh, blood thinning properties, which causes problems. Uh, it's called Chinese restaurant syndrome, or it used to be probably not anymore, but it was because of that issue. Even agaricus, it was number one in nanopoisonings, eight in three years. So this is pretty surprising to me. 
it's just a cautionary note whenever you're eating mushrooms. So here are the pictures of, you're all familiar with white mutton. So this is the portobello and the cremini. They're the same mushroom. They're all Garicus bisporus. So just package this slightly different way. Here's the taki. Here's the different types of pluros. This is the classic oyster. And then there are a few others, the royal trumpet or king oyster. And the pom pom, which is sort of a lion's mane. And then the other ones are uh, flamingo. I never could pronounce this, so I'll just say Anoki Taki, which is the, uh, the Japanese word. And then the beach mushroom, which I think they made that up. These are the ones that are available in Phillips as well. So as we wind down, let me just encourage you about the fact that mushrooms are very good for you. Fungi are very good for you in terms of nutrition, very high in protein. And here we have button mushroom, Oyster mushroom and shiitake, just the three. And there's also the sap or a king bullies here. That's the tree here, which is not so good. But more importantly is the amino acid side of it. Uh, the mushrooms, those three have all eight, and so far the ones that have been measured most, all of them have all eight essential amino acids. This is what keeps you alive. So here is that table showing again, the button mushroom, shiitake mushroom, and the oyster mushroom. And these are the eight essential amino acids. So my references, as I mentioned, were growing gourmet and medicinal mushrooms. Uh, it's a good reference text by Paul Stamets. Uh, more recently, Trag Cotter put out the organic mushroom farming, not framing, farming. I'm not sure I, uh, it's called a spoonerism, uh, and microremediation. And then I, I've always broadcast The Fifth Kingdom by Bryce Kendrick, which is an excellent reference for all things fungi, for those of us who are not scientists, in mycologists, I should say, but are interested. Uh, finally, uh, I got my spawn from Fungi Perfect Eye. Here's their email. I mentioned mushroom people. There's also everything mushrooms and Phelps. I just put those on here. Uh, they don't sell anything other than, you know, mushrooms that they've already grown on. But you can visit them, they have a nice showroom. Um, and also there are other people, particularly Jared Urchek, our second vice president, who is pretty knowledgeable about this, who I would uh, encourage you to contact via me if you would like. So that is the wonderful world of fungi. And there's a lot more out there, obviously. So beautiful American seeds of mushrooom, scrambled egg slime, which is not a mushroom, stalk puffball and aspic, one of the world's most bizarre fungi, and my favorite recipe, puffball a la, la pain perdu, which is the French word for French toast. 